as you sit here, <coughs> you'll be making choices for the entire hour. The primary choice will be whether to stay with the breath. If you made up your mind at the beginning of the session that that's what you're going to do, see what happens when you stick with that decision. Each time the question comes up, if there's a little stirring about the thought in the mind, try to choose to come back to the breath. Let the thought go. Unless it's a thought that's related to the breath and is helpful for getting the mind to settle down. The mind is always making choices, both when you're meditating and when you're not. In fact, that's its primary activity. As the Buddha says, we fabricate the aggregates for the sake of having them, for the sake of using them. So that gives us two things right there. We have goals what the Buddha calls atta, and the means toward the goals. This is the way the mind functions. This is the way it gropes through the world, learning about things, learning what works, what doesn't work, what kinds of goals are possible, which ones are not possible. And it's because of this that life has meaning. If we weren't making any choices, if we were machines, there'd be no meaning to it at all. This is one of the reasons why the word for goal is also the word for meaning in Pali, atta. We look to things, we look for meanings, instructions or advice on what are good goals and what are good things to do, what's worth doing, what's not worth doing. Even when you think of the meaning of words, in some cases the meanings get translated into other words. But then you start thinking about well, what is the meaning of the fact that we have language? It's one of our tools for finding what we want. And if it gets us to what we want, then it, it has meaning, life has meaning. You could say that we live by meanings. I've been reading an account of Knut Rasmussen going across northern North America. He was interviewing a lot of different shamans, different storytellers, poets among the Inuit. And he's always interested in finding out what the meanings of the stories were. There was one case, though. Well, one of the story tellers told him a story about a fox and a wolf. The fox tells the wolf that he's learned how to use his tail to catch fish. The wolf wants to know how to do that. He'd like to have some extra fish in his diet. So the fox says, well, you dig a hole in the ice and then you stick your tail down into the hole. And if you feel anything nibbling at the end of the tail, then you pull it up and then you've got a fish. So the wolf does as he's told, and the fox gets out of there as fast as he can, because he knows what's going to happen. The wolf's tail gets frozen into the ice. So what does he have to do? Well, he has to bite off his tail. Of course, he's angry at the fox, and he goes looking for the fox. The fox sees him coming, and he takes some leaves and he puts them in front of his eyes, so the wolf can't recognize him. The wolf comes up to him and says, have you seen that other fox? And the fox says, I'm sorry, I haven't seen anything. I'm snow blinded right now. That's why I have these leaves in front of my eyes. The wolf believes him and goes away. End of story. And Rasmussen asks the storyteller, what is the meaning of that story? And the storyteller says, why do you have to have a meaning? This is what's the problem with all you white people. You have to have meanings for things. One one way the storyteller was right, and one way is wrong. I mean, if the story were totally meaningless, if it weren't amusing, if it weren't entertaining, there'd be no purpose in telling it. The purpose it does have a purpose. This purpose is entertainment, but it doesn't have a moral. 
aside from being learn how to be really careful around foxes. But for the most part, most of our stories do have meanings in the sense of we look for what they tell us about life. Those are the satisfying stories, the stories that give us some sense of direction, some advice on what is a good attitude to take to life. And so it's only natural that we look for the meanings of things that we can then translate into how we make choices in our lives. This is why the Dharma has a atta, it has a meaning. It's designed to satisfy that desire. It gives us a goal, and it gives us a means to the goal. And that's what insight is all about, teaching us what's worth doing for the sake of a really high-level goal putting an end to suffering. Sometimes you hear insight defined as just seeing the nature of things. Well, what good is that unless there's something about the nature of things that you can put into action to serve your purposes? That's where the Buddha's teachings, the basic teachings for insight, are the Four Noble Truths. It teaches a means. First it teaches the problem and the cause of the problem, but then it teaches a means for dealing with the problem, in other words, the Eightfold Path. And then the cessation of suffering, the Third Noble Truth. That's the goal. And when you see those things, then you know that you really have gained insight, and you've used your insight properly. This is why stream entry is defined as attaining the Eightfold Path and a large part of the Eightfold Path. Is right view, Four Noble Truths. And it's a person who's attained the stream of sun to be someone who's consummate in view. In other words, you've really seen all four truths. There's that description of stream entry, which is that whatever subject to origination is all subject to passing away. It sounds like you're simply seeing the nature of things to come and go. But you have to stop and think, what is the state of mind in which that observation would naturally occur. If it's just a generalization about how life has been so far, everything you've seen so far seems to come and go. It's a pretty sloppy observation. You can't prove it. The only time you can prove it is if you see something that's not subject to origination, and you see that that doesn't pass away. That's when Sarabhuta, after he came to his first experience of the Dharma, when he went to see Moggallana. This was before they had met the Buddha. Moggallana sees him coming from afar, and he says, Your complexion is bright, your faculties are bright. Have you seen the deathless? And Sarabhuta says, Yes. So it's in seeing the deathless that you, you look back on things that are not deathless, and you realize that the difference is that they're subject to origination and passing away, but the deathless is not. So it's in seeing that that insight becomes complete, and this is what insight is good for. This is what it means. Sometimes you hear that insight is seeing things in terms of the three characteristics, but then the three characteristics are more properly the three perceptions. What are they good for? If you simply say, well, everything is impermanent. What does that tell you about what to do? You can take that observation, do all kinds of things with it. You can decide, well, nothing is worth striving for at all. Might as well give up. In other words, that insight on its own can be very defeatist. You use these perceptions properly when you put them in the context of the Four Noble Truths. You put them in the context of that analysis the Buddha has for learning how to gain escape from things that weigh the mind down. You see their origination, you see their passing away, you see their allure, and then you see their drawbacks. And it's in the context of their drawbacks that you apply those three perceptions. You look for the 
extent to which they're inconstant, stressful, not self. So that you can develop dispassion for them. That dispassion is going to be your escape. So those observations have meaning only in the larger context of the meaning of the Dhamma, the goal of the Dhamma, the Atta. This is why when the Buddha described his awakening, he never talks about the three characteristics of even the three perceptions. They're there implicitly in terms of the duties of the Four Noble Truths. or the insight into the drawbacks of things that weigh the mind down. But the Buddha never explicitly mentions them. He's explicit about the Four Noble Truths. He says, when you see those, we see them clearly in the same way that a person standing by a, a bank of a pool of water would look into the pool of water. The water is clean, and it can see the fish moving around and resting. When you see the Four Noble Truths clearly in that way, that's when insight has shown what it's good for. That's what its atta is, its purpose is. So we're here not to learn so much about the nature of things outside. We're here more to learn about the nature of the mind as it's making choices, which choices are worth making. to get to a goal that doesn't serve as a means to anything else. And that's when we find something that really satisfies the heart and mind, something that has intrinsic meaning. This meaning doesn't depend on pointing to something else or serving a purpose for the sake of something else. It's the one thing that we do everything else for the sake of. We all want happiness. That's what we're groping around the world for, as we make our choices and then learn from them, or sometimes don't learn from them. The Buddha simply gives instructions on how to go about it well. Use appropriate attention. Ask the right questions. Look at your actions. Train the mind so that it's in a position where it can see its actions and the results really clearly. That's why we're here right now. The breath is here to train the mind. We train the mind for the sake of true happiness. These are all means to a goal. And although you don't get to the goal by focusing on it or trying to clone the goal, You have to pay attention on the, to the means and do them really carefully. Still, it's good to have in the back of the mind the realization that this does serve a purpose, and have a general idea of what that purpose is, because that's what keeps us on course.